everyone learns differently, everyone preps differently. And yeah, I wish guys would sometimes do more like, buddy, like we've talked about this. Ah, you know, da da da. Like it's always the same excuse and it's, it's frustrating, but everyone's not gonna do things the way I do them. 13 seasons of professional football can go by in a flash. And I was grateful for every second of it. This game gave me everything, not without taking a few pieces of me along with it. Playing offensive line, it's been one of the most rewarding and fulfilling experiences of my life. Now, thanks to Audible, I look forward to sharing insights and stories with you of our favorite NFL stars, and of course, the fraternity of athletes that protect them. Offensive linemen are eternally bonded, and I am proud to forever be a part of the Blocking Brotherhood. I'm Ryan Khalil, and this is Block Forever. Welcome to Block Forever with yours truly, Ryan Khalil. I'm very excited because the conversation you're going to hear today is a glimpse into the mind of a truly great player and even better person. I'm talking about my former teammate, Luke Keekley. If you're listening to the show, I'm sure you're familiar with who Luke Keekley is and what an incredible player he was. I've heard people describe him as Superman on the field and Clark Kent off of it. That's a pretty accurate description of Luke. He is seriously just the nicest, most humble, high integrity guy off the field. And then when the game begins, he is an absolute monster between the lines. He's one of the greatest to ever play. He'll be a Hall of Famer. Quick story. This must have been 2017. My wife was pregnant with our son. And after the game, I came up to Luke's dad, Tom, and I asked him if I could sincerely meet with him in the offseason. And he kind of looked at me confused and kind of went along and said, yeah, sure, why? And my answer was simple. I said, so I could figure out how to raise my son to be like your son, Luke. It's amazing to me, Luke only played eight years for the Carolina Panthers, but he definitely left his mark on his teammates, on the organization, on the city, on the game of professional football, and of course on me, and I'm so proud to call him a friend. Quickly, before we get to our conversation, just a reminder to tune in Thursday Night Football only on Amazon Prime. This week, it's my Carolina Panthers. They host the Falcons. Coach Wilkes, man, he's there. He's trying to right the ship in Carolina. I love Coach. I'm rooting for him. I'll be watching my guys for sure. All right, prepare yourself for a whole lot of defensive jargon. Don't worry, a lot of it went over my head, but you're going to enjoy this conversation. The one and only Luke Keekley. Well, here he is, ladies and gentlemen, the great Luke Keekley, looking absolutely like Captain America, and he could still put on pads and suit up and play. What's going on, buddy? How are you doing? <laughs> What's going on? Uh, I got a front row seat for seven seasons to watch one of the smartest, most instinctive linebackers to ever play the game. And not only that, one of the best, most stand-up people I've ever met. I always joke that you're not a real person that you can't be that good of a football player and that great of a guy off the field and that there's something else and we're going to figure out what it is, but we've yet <laughs> to find that out. Let me, I can't even remember, Luke. I'm trying to, I mean, you came in, I remember we drafted you. I don't remember thinking much of it. You kind of were like a uh, nerd. You know, you were in good shape. You're an okay build. You had glasses. I was like, yeah, I guess. I don't know. I mean, yeah, sure. Is this white guy from Boston college? He's probably going to make about four tackles a week. Like that's, yeah, it sounds good. It sounds like a good pick. And then you ended up being this phenom. What was that transition? I, I can't remember. Do you remember where you yeah. started, where you kind of became Luke? I remember the first day I walked into the locker room when I was there, we're getting ready for practice or OTAs or whatever it was. And I look over in Beast and he's just like chiseled Greek God shredded. John Beeson was shredded. A, he was a specimen, man. And then Stu was stacked, but like 245, yoked. And then Bruce Campbell was like eight feet tall, huge, long arms. John Beeson, Jonathan Stewart, Bruce Campbell. These guys are not real humans. These guys are like Marvel superheroes. Yeah. And I was like, I am not cut out for this. Um, And then we go out to practice and uh, it was like a two by two player. I was on the backside of like a zone. And I was in the B gap and in college, it's like, all right, front side run. Like I'll just kind of run over there and it'll be fine. 
They snapped the ball. And do you remember who, you know who the right tackle was my first snap? Yeah, I remember a six foot six, 330 pound Jeff Ota. I, the ball was snapped. I started kind of moving into my right. And I just remember, I just like run into a wall. And it was Ota. And I'm like, how did he, how did he get there? Number one, he got there so fast. And I was like, well, that's different. And then uh, I remember my, the first game we played and we played Tampa and they had this fullback. His name was Eric Lorig. He was number 41 and he killed me. And that first year was like, number one, things are faster. Number two, guys are stronger. But the physicality of the game was so much greater than it was in college. And that took me, that took me a while to figure it out. Do you still watch the game? Yeah. Just the big games or are you watching a lot? Um, well, Sunday I watched the team, obviously the Panthers. And then I, I just like tomorrow night I'll turn the game on. Like there's no reason for me not to turn it on. Um, I love football. I love the game. I like seeing how it's changed over the years from when I got into when I, where, where it is now, you know, you have so many connections with guys. Like, obviously I love Buffalo. Like, um, I really like their two linebackers up there. Milano is a BC guy. And then Tremaine Edmonds, just, they remind me of Thomas, Thomas and I just two guys that a Mike and a will that get along great, that are great dudes that play so hard. Like mm. I love watching them. They're in the same system that we were in. And then obviously Christian out in San Francisco. Now there's just so many, there's so many guys that you root for and then guys that you played against that you enjoy watching and you want to have success. You just have such a vested interest in guys over the course of your career that that's why I still enjoy watching the game because I just want my my guys to play well and have fun and have success. I always forget that you played with Thomas Davis. That's such an unbelievable linebacker core you were part of. And I think Thomas doesn't really get the respect he deserves. Such an underrated player. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you about watching guys that you know. When you're watching this new crop of quarterbacks, who are the guys that you enjoy watching the most? I mean, you look at you look at Mahomes and Josh, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think super fun to watch is uh, Lamar. He's just fun to watch. Like, if you don't like watching his game, it's like uh, then I don't know what to tell you. I think I think Burrow is. Um, I love his demeanor and just like he's like super mellow. Um, mm -hmm. The guy in, for the Chargers is. Super fun to watch Herbert. I mean, those are the young guys that I think, I think are kind of the next wave of the next wave of dudes. I might be missing some guys. What's the best way to stop Lamar or Mahomes? Oh, I mean, completely different dudes. I think with with Lamar, you just you gotta you can't let them start running the ball, and you can't let him explosives. Right? Their explosive plays are just killer. He gets in space, you're not tackling him. We played Kaepernick. We always just had designated guys for certain aspects of the run. So you're responsible for the quarterback. And what we'd always try to do is get an extra guy over there, whether it's a safety, whether it's a back, or whether it's a D lineman. You know, if you know where they're running the zone read, how can you get an extra body over there to help out in that run game? And then with Mahomes, I think you just can't let him throw the ball over your head. I mean, he's so good. You got to hope that. You let him, you make him throw the ball eight, 10 yards down the field at a time and hope that there's an incompletion or a penalty or they drop a ball or they run it and it's, they don't get it. Because if he, if he can just sit back there and throw the ball over your head, you're screwed. You gotta let, you gotta find a, a situation where you throw, the, he throws the ball in front of you, you tackle it and you make him drive down the field and hopefully there's a penalty or a drop or something stupid happens and they can't continue their drive. I wanna go back to, you growing up in Ohio, sort of your football trajectory. I'm sure there's a lot of dads. There's a lot of uh, aspiring young linebackers that probably want to hear a lot about this. Um, but something I've always found interesting was you didn't play youth football at a young, young age. Is that correct? So I started playing lacrosse in, I think that would have been fifth grade. My older brother played saxophone and he used to take saxophone lessons at a local high school um, in the area. So I would go there after school with my brother. We would sit there and I'd sit in the lobby when he would go do his, his saxophone lessons. I'd usually do my homework. And then when I got done with my homework, I'd be so bored. And I'd look out the window and there was a sport on the field out there and I didn't know what it was. So I was like, I'm gonna go see what that is. One day I went out there and I watched a lacrosse game and I, and I came back in, I told my mom, this game looks awesome. They get to hit each other with sticks. 
So the next week comes around, we go, John's doing saxophone, I go outside and we watch the lacrosse game and I was like, man, this is awesome. It's fast, it's physical. It was an awesome sport and I started playing that, I think in fifth grade. So my two predominant sports growing up all the way through high school were football and lacrosse. What position did you play in lacrosse? I imagine you were some kind of enforcer. I took face-offs, which is obviously the draw play after a goal. They call them fogos, so fake face-off, get off. Those are, all those guys do is come in and take a face-off. Once the face-off is done, they try to get off the field as fast as they can. I was always really pretty good at that, and that was my niche in lacrosse. I didn't really score goals. I didn't really, I wasn't an attack guy. I wasn't flashy, but I was really good at that one aspect. Um, I actually started getting recruited I got recruited to play lacrosse and that all started before football. But for me, I think I always knew deep down that I wanted to play football, but that was the first experience of college recruiting that I really had. So you're at Boston College, you win the Buckus Award for the top linebacker in the country. I can't imagine people expecting you to be this absolutely dominating National Football League linebacker. Looking back, what would you say was the secret to your success once you got into the NFL? Oh my gosh. I think I was, I always looked for advantages. How can I get an advantage? And for me, it was off season. I felt like it was off season training and then in season studying. So tape, how you, how you address meetings, how seriously you take meetings. I think that's what kind of defined me as a player was where can I find my advantages? Cause I was never going to be the biggest. I wasn't a super physical guy. Um, I wasn't a thumper, but for me, I felt like I can get one step ahead based on understanding of not only the defense, but what offenses are doing, and then falling back on off-season training. I think those kind of meshed really well together and helped me in my career. I interviewed Juju recently, and he said something to me that I hear everybody who's ever gone up against you say, which is, you always knew the play before the snap even happened. It was like you were teleporting uh, right before the snap to where the play was going to be. Talk me through your process of how you study film, what you're looking for. What was your superpower that gave you the ability to sort of know what was happening, you know, maybe even sometimes before their own players knew? I think a lot of it started when I was in high school. So when I was in high school, our head coach would always have us down to his office during lunch. He'd put the game on the TV and a cassette. We'd watch the game, we'd eat our lunch, we'd kind of casually watch it. Every once in a while, he'd pause stuff and he'd be like, all right, when we get this in the game, we need to make sure that we're doing X, Y, and Z. And you don't really think much of it and then you get into the game and the play gets snapped and boom. It happened exactly how it happened on tape. So from a young age, I was very fortunate to have somebody that valued it, number one, but also success with the process. So we watched it, we talked about it, and then it showed up in a game. And I was like, wow, that's an easy way to get ahead. People talk about you and your film study habits and how much film you study. It's such an understatement to me because I saw it for years and years and years. I mean, I never seen a guy watch as much film as you. I remember that the one moment I always tell people is um, we were in the middle of the season and uh, we were playing really well. I forget what year it was. And uh, we had a long Friday. Usually we get out pretty early, but we had a long Friday and there was a plan for all of us to go out and have dinner. And we kept trying to get you to go and you were not happy with your film study for that week. You wanted to watch more. And you were like, I think I'm going to stay here. I'm going to ice and then watch some more film. And I was like, you want me to come pick you up? You're like, yeah, sure. So I came back like two and a half, three hours later and you were still watching film and we ended up sitting in there and I got, it was the first time I got to watch what you watch and how you watch it. And I was so blown away. And then I ended up leaving there without you. You went to dinner. I remember feeling so shitty about how I prepared for games. I'm like, oh, I don't know if you remember this. I was like, yeah, this is why you'll go to the hall of fame and I won't. <laughs> I watched you watch a lot of film, but take me through what your process of that film study actually was. What I would always do is I'd always start watching the game, watching teams. So the first, on Mondays we'd get done, I would watch, when we'd all be done with the day, I would watch two first halves of a team. So I feel like watching a first half, you got a good feel for what they want to do, how they're trying to attack people what they're good at because sometimes in the second half you get up big or you're down big and it kind of changes. I feel like who teams were. So if they're down big, maybe you're throwing the ball more or whatever. 
I'd watch two first halves. I kind of click through it and all right, boom, we're playing the Carolina Panthers. All right. They've got a really athletic center. They've got a tight end. Who's really good. He's smart. He can get open their guards. One's big and physical. The other guy's a quick, nasty guy. Both tackles are smart and edgy. Maybe the running back's big and physical and the quarterback can do everything. I'd watch two games. It'd probably take like an hour, around 15 minutes. And you just kind of write down like general thoughts. Like, this is how they run the ball. This is how they pass the ball. This is kind of personnel. On Tuesday, I'd come in, I'd watch run game. So um, Coach Wash always had a really good run game tape that he put together. And it was probably 75 to 120 plays of what they want to do. So he'd break it down by, you know, personnel or formation or types of runs. So then I had like a really good template of how they were going to run the ball. So gap schemes, wide zone, formation base, where guys line up. Um, and you just kind of take notes on all that. And then I'd go watch, I'd get a bunch of games and watch, watch the run game and click through. And you start to get a feel based on formation, which running backs in the game, maybe they bring a different tight end in. What does the formation dictate? Is it tight? Is it spread out? Where are my keys on certain formations? If a tight end's off the ball, do I need to look at him? Is he going to tell me where the ball is going? And then you'd watch a game and see kind of how it all fit together. And Wednesday, I'd watch um, first and second down pass. Then Thursday, I'd watch third down in red zone. Friday, you watch specials. So like specials for me would be, you know, like if we were playing the Carolina Panthers and I had a lot of matchups with the running back out of the backfield, I'd have to watch all of Christian stuff. How does he like to run his routes? What are his moves? How does he set you up? And then that way, by the time you get to the end of the week, you've probably watched six or seven games. You've seen a bunch of cut-ups. You know what they want to do, when they want to do it, how are they going to attack us? And I felt like a big thing that was always really important for me was try to watch teams um, that look like us on defense. So if I'm going to, if I'm watching a team that lines mm -hmm. up in three, four, five down, like their run game is going to look completely different than it is against us, which we're primarily a four down front. So you can get stuck watching, watching tape, but at the end of the day, getting nothing out of it. And I learned that early on in my career in the NFL, I watched, I forget who I was watching, but the team that they were playing on third down was predominantly a man coverage team. And we were primarily zone at that point in time in Carolina and I remember sitting there on third and seven and being like, dude, I freaking got this. They didn't show me one formation I watched. They didn't show me run, one route I watched, guessing on everything. And I was so confused as to why they didn't do anything they'd shown the previous three weeks. And I asked somebody about it and they're like, well, yeah, because the teams that you watched were all man coverage teams. And I was like, well, I guess I guess I have to try to take that into account more and there's a lot of those situations. I remember one time we played, we played the Falcons and I had a good feel for Atlanta. We played, we played them a lot. I was sitting on a run play the whole game. They lined up in that formation probably five or six times during the game. Not once did they run that run. And I remember being frustrated. I remember the ref came up to me during the game and he said, it was kind of towards the end of the game. He's like, what were you, what were you looking at this, this game? I was like, what do you mean? He's like, He's like, I've never seen you out of out of position so much. And I said, I've been sitting on a run all game and they haven't run it. So that was it was cool because you understand that, like, you, you can never get too comfortable and you can't wait on plays. And that's what happened in that game, which I typically didn't do. I was usually you got to line up. You got to have your four or five things you're looking at and then you got to react. And it's how fast can you process? How fast can you react? Instead of doing that, I was like guessing. You learn something new every year of your career. And that was something that I kind of caught myself like guessing instead of reacting. And it was cool that that ref pointed it out to me. It was pretty cool. That's a good point you made about sitting on that formation. How from week to week, how much are these coordinators sort of trying to set you up with things that they've done in certain formations and trying to get you to guess or think they're going to do something? How much variation are you seeing in game plans from week to week? I think you look at it, if you're an offense coordinator, you always look at it from the perspective of what did I show last week, right? And then I think where the guys are really good are in game. So like they show you something, they show you something, they show you something, then they have something off of it. There was two, I got two really good examples. We played the New Orleans Saints and New Orleans Saints run, they run duo all the time. 
Um, that's one of their core concepts. But whenever they start getting into the red zone, they like to throw like this, like hard sell it pass in like their number one receiver runs like a, he runs like a, a corner out. They, it just is like a, like a real sloppy, like fade, like find open space, get open. And so I remember I was like, all right, well, Sean's going to have something for us. Like, I don't know what it is. And he always, he always shows it to you to get your eyes on it. And then to, to, he wants you to, he wants to find a way to attack, attack your eyes. So like this was, I don't 2018, maybe 20, 2018, I want to say they were going left to right. It came out the first series. They started in three by one there in like 12 personnel or whatever. And they motioned a the guy down and ran duo. And then the next series they lined up in that. And this was like high red zone. And then snuck a guy out and threw it, drew through it over the top. And so basically what Sean's thinking is like, I'm going to show him duo early in the game. I'm going to get their eyes all over it. And then the next series, whenever that situation pops itself up, I'm going to show them that same look and then I'm going to have something off of it. And they're super, they're super intentional about who they attack, right? If they have a corner or somebody that plays with good eyes or is an older veteran, he's not going to do it to him because he's already seen it before. He's very intentional with how he does things. And I think he makes him a fantastic coordinator. And that was, that was one example. We played Cleveland in 2018. Remember the game up in Cleveland? Mm -hmm. They lined up in like bunch. They motioned a guy down. It looked like crack. And then they gave like a, it was like a counter reverse, like a really weird set. And it got us flowing fast and then going the opposite direction. So they did it one time, hit a big play. And then they came back to it. And I was like, there's no way, there's no way they do the same play twice. Cause I'm like thinking, all right, well, so if they hit this play on us once, they know we're gonna go to the sideline, we're gonna make the adjustment, we're gonna have our eyes in the right place. There's no way they run it again, they're gonna have something off of it. So I'm like, perfect. So I remember they came back out, same set, same everything, same motion. I'm like, oh, boom, here comes crack, or crack toss. I'm like, I'm gonna smack this guy, run the same play again. Again, big play. I think they scored a touchdown on it the second time. So that's the part that I always enjoyed during the game was what do they what do they see from us? What do we what do they know that we're looking at and that we're addressing? And then that's where it's like the ball gets snapped and it's like play your responsibility. Where's your key? What's your key telling you to do? Trust your key and go. And every once in a while you start getting a little bit greedy and trying to make a big play, and that's when bad stuff happens. So it happens early in my career. It happened late in my career. And it really, to me, it always came down to eyes in the right spot. Where's my alignment? What do I need to look at? And once the ball snapped, I need to do my job. What about with coaches? How much of your film study was, was translating over to ideas or concepts or things that you thought you guys should do or look out for in, in sort of folding that into the game plan? We always had a really open dialogue with um, the coordinator. So so obviously it started with McD and then Wilkes and then Eric Washington. Um, but I just remember I had, I had a majority of my time with McDermott, I think five years with McDermott. And he would always come up to us and be like, Hey, what do you guys like? What do you don't like? And, you know, sometimes you'd be like, Hey, I really like it. Some days I'd be like, you know what? I don't, I don't like this pressure because of X, Y, and Z. Like we're not seeing it. We can't get it right. Or like, I don't understand why we're doing it because we have X, Y, and Z. And he'd either be like, you know what? Good point and get rid of it out of the game plan. Or he'd come back and say, hey, I know what you're saying, but this is why I want to do this. And it sometimes it was always helped to just communicate it because you'd line up there and in practice, be like, this is stupid. Like, I don't, why are we doing this? And when you'd ask the question, you'd always get really good clarity on why he wanted to do it. He's like, well, this is the back of tackle or this guy's got a a knee or we need to put pressure in his face to this side of his, of the formation, because that's where he likes to throw hot. So we want to get bodies in his face, um, stuff like that. And I felt like that was always a really, was really important because it gave us, it gave us a lot of, uh, ownership of, of the game plan. So you get in there in a game and there was nothing in that game plan that we didn't either talk about, or we didn't hash something out. There was never like, man, that's stupid. Like, why are we doing this? And then they call it in a game. You're like, this is dumb. A lot of it was like, boom, we all agreed that this is good. So if it works great, if not, like we've already talked about it and we should have got it right. So there was a lot of ownership. It, it made us feel like we were really a part of the game plan. Um, I always enjoyed knowing why we were doing things because it helped me kind of wrap my head around it. 
And then in the game, like McDermott and I w- were on such a good page that like in the games, you're like, man, I hope it's third and seven, man. Like, I hope he calls this and he'd call it and you'd be like, oh yeah, let's go. And all the guys would love it. And, um, we, I was very fortunate with those three guys that I had as coordinators, Wash, Wilkes and McD, that they all kind of had that same feel and vibe throughout the week. It's obvious, uh, with a lot of the terminology and phrases you're using to describe uh strategy and schemes and a lot of it over my head uh how smart you are and how much you cared and how much uh you studied did it bother you knowing how many professional football players did not take the game as serious as you did not study as much film where you're like god i wish these guys would study more film i wish they would watch as much. I wish they would come in on Friday and not go to dinner and, uh, and finish up this last minute run tape. Well, I think a lot of it, everyone, everyone learns differently. Everyone preps differently. And I think there's a really healthy balance. And sometimes I feel like I maybe, I probably spent too much time doing things, but yeah, I mean, to answer your question, yeah, I wish guys would sometimes do more like, like buddy, like we've talked about this, like, why, like, why aren't you there? ah, you know, da, da, da. Like it's always the same excuse and it's, it's frustrating, but also I think it, you, you find ways to get to guys in different ways, like manners, like, okay, everyone's not going to do things the way I do them. And that's okay. And I can't expect somebody to do it my way, just like they can't expect me to do it their way. So I think you learn a lot about not only yourself, but how to deal with different personalities in the locker room. Because at the end of the day, like that guy's going to be on the field with you during the game and you got to rely on him and he's going to rely on you. So maybe he doesn't prep the same way you do, but how can, it's always a healthy balance between how do we get the best out of each player and each guy's best is different. Um, but it's, how can you be supportive? How can you get the most out of guys? Maybe they saw something different, maybe cause you know, I mean, I think the one thing that's unique about football is everybody's game experience is vastly different. Mm -hmm. Your game experience is always, I will never be able to understand what it's like It's pl- like to play center. Like, I'll never understand what it's like to play running back. Like, I'll never understand what it's like to play corner. And so I always was like, man, why don't they do things the same way I do? Maybe it's because it, it's not the same application at the position, the way their game is played. So I was always get frustrated. I always wanted everybody to be 100% locked in all the time. But in reality, that's not always a situation. You have to be okay with that. And you just got to find ways to like, connect with guys, get the best out of guys, because the way you do things isn't always right. The way they do things isn't always right. And everybody does things a certain way. And you got to be, you got to be okay with that. And that's, that's something that you learn throughout your career as well. Well, that's not entirely true that you'll never know, or you never knew what it was like to block. Cause I've seen you guys get many uh, interceptions and watch you just run downfield and head hunt guys yeah. and drive them into the ground. And likewise, I know what it's like to be blocked after throwing a pick and just getting absolutely blindsided (laughs) by a linebacker or a defensive end just looking to pay back for any kind of down blocks or side blocks they've had. Well, the thing that stinks for you guys playing offense is you guys, you guys have to block certain people on run plays. When there's an interception, like, eh, maybe I don't want to go block Andrew Nowell. So Intercep- not- interceptions are like all hell breaks loose. It's yeah. the most chaotic, scariest, craziest adrenaline high thing I've ever been a part of. Because you you are you're like trying to find the guy the ball, but then your head is on a swivel. Just Somebody's looking trying for to guys. kill you. Somebody is trying to take you out of the game. <laughs> and sometimes not clean either. Some guys are just like, if I can get this guy out of the game, that's going to make my job way easier. What was your thought process that Thursday night Thanksgiving game when you got that pick and you you went headhunting for Tony Romo. I saw you change course. You had a clear path to the to get score, and you changed course just so you could go stiff arm him. Because I was a terrible pressure guy. I stunk at blitzing. I never hit quarterbacks ever. And I was like, well, here's an opportunity. And he kept running at me, and I was like, I'm just going to run at him and see what happens. <laughs> We've had this on offense through my whole career, whether it be college or pros, the coordinator comes up and he goes, what do you guys want to do in this situation? What are you guys feeling like? And sort of looks to the captains or or the leaders of the group. How often does that come up for you guys? I feel like a lot of it was um, like third down or in two minutes specifically. So like in third down, 
trying to think like, especially like after a timeout, right? Or say it's, say it's third down and they call a timeout and it's third and seven and it's like a big moment in the game. I'd always come over there because you know, you know how it is. Like when you're in the huddle, you get a feel for, you, you get a really good feel for the guys up front. Like I always felt like that was super important. What are those guys like? So it's like, maybe, maybe those guys like the matchup. Maybe they had a good feel for protection and you always got a really good feel and you could always talk to those guys throughout the game and be like, Hey, what do you guys like? They'd be like, boom, I want to run this pressure. It was close last time, or I want to run this inside game. And then I would sometimes just tell them like, Hey, this is what the guys like. So I feel like the dialogue was always really open. And then, and then on in the, in two minute, because I always felt like you always had an opportunity to talk about the two minute situation before you go on the field, whether we were in four minute and offense we're driving the ball. You look at the clock, you get a feel. So we'd always come over as a group and be like, I always like playing quarters. I'm a huge quarters guy because I like my matchups. I had, I feel like I had good flexibility in the past game. So I always liked that. And we had three or four pressures that we liked. And then you talk to the DBs and be like, hey, what are your matchups like? What do you like? What don't you like? So our guys are always super open to ideas and concepts and um, how and they always wanted to know how we saw things on the field because that was such a big part of the equation as well. So yeah, to answer your question, I think third down was a big example of that, and then obviously prepping for two minute. Coach McDermott, you always said was going to be a great head coach. He's doing an amazing job in Buffalo. What do you think makes him so great? I think he's hyper competitive. He's always looking for the next thing. He's always looking for an edge. Like he never thinks that he's good enough. Um, I think he's got a huge chip on his shoulder. He's largely had success for a large part of his career. You know, obviously he started under Andy Reid, and I think that's a big motivation for him. And I don't think that'll ever really stop because of the situation in the AFC with with Mahomes and Andy Reid and the Chiefs, and then now them with Josh and McDee with the Bills. Like, I think he's so driven, and I don't think there's an ounce of complacency in his body. Um I think that's helped him a lot. I think he's got really good coaches around him. I think Leslie Frazier has been a stud. I think they've done a tremendous job on the offensive side of the ball with their, you know, their quote pipeline on offense. So obviously McDee's a defensive coach. So you got to set up the offense to have success because with a guy like Josh, these coordinators are going to get jobs. Obviously Dayball is a fantastic coach. Um, he was going to get a job eventually because Josh is such a good player. He's a great coach. Mm -hmm. But then, boom, now you bump Dorse up. And Dorse was the quarterback's coach, obviously, with us in Carolina for a long time. Knows the system, knows Josh, has familiarity with everybody. And then, eventually, Dorse will get his his lick at playing, at being a head coach. And then, boom, now they bump up Joe Brady, who would got there this year. That was with us in Carolina. He is, he's done a really good job of building coaches from within. And I think that's super, super beneficial, good awareness. But the guy is so hyper competitive and there's no complacency he's always looking for an edge and he loves he loves the game of football he's also a normal guy yeah that's one thing i always loved about him is like you know I, we've been around some great coaches before but there's some guys unless you talk about football they don't know how to function in any kind of like social setting or conversation and mcdermott was always a guy and is still a guy who i feel like you could go on a long road trip with and have a great time you know what i mean but still is like competitive can turn on. He's got that great defensive mind, that great football mind. You've been around a lot of coaches too. Don't you think yeah. that's like, that's the case in the NFL? Yeah. I think one thing that helped him a lot was he allowed, he gave guys space to, to like get on him, like mess around with him. Like in, and when we were rolling, we had, you know, we had TD and Charles and then we had peanut and Jared Allen and Roman. And we had all these older vets that were established guys and they had a ton of respect for McD and the coaching staff, but they would, they would rag on him and rag on him and rag on him and rag on him. And I think he secretly loved it. And I think it made him very relatable to a lot of the younger guys in the team. Like, Hey, like this guy's our coach and he's serious and blah, blah, blah. But like guys were, guys would get on him hard in front of people. And it was, it was so funny. TD would always like rough house with him, like pick him up, push him, like push him around. And I think he, and I think he loved it. And I think that was one thing that he was very relatable. He gave guys space to like be themselves and have fun. And he dished it right back too. So it wasn't like a one way street. He was giving it both ways, but man, he was just, 
He was fun to be around. He could get on you if you needed to. And everybody understood, all right, well, he's going to have fun. But at the same time, when he needs to dial it in, he has no problem doing that. Were there ever any moments where you and him weren't on the same page or where, you know, things got a little heated between the two of you? He crushed me one year in a locker room bad. What do you mean? We played Baltimore. It was 2014. And TD, TD was either going to be up or down. He's like 50-50. He practiced all week and like on and off. And like he had a hammy and it came to game time and like he couldn't go. And I was like all pissy and like in my feelings and played like crap the, fir- the first half. And um, I was getting pushed around. I was just playing bad. And I was like feeling bad for myself. And he came in at halftime and his elbows were all like, you could tell we'd been like banging them on the table. And like, they were all like, you could tell. And uh, he was talking to us. He was like pretty, like pretty under control, like um, low key, like not low key, but like he wasn't yelling and screaming. And I remember at the end, he looked at me and pointed at me in front of the whole defense that he like, let me have it. And I just remember being like, man, like, you don't know what he's talking about, blah, blah, blah. And then I remember getting ready to go out for the second half. And I was like, he was right. Like I was playing pretty, I was playing pretty poorly. What did he say? Oh, just, you're playing soft. You're feeling sorry for yourself. You're upset that TD's not playing just because he's not playing. Doesn't mean you can play poorly, blah, blah, blah. And it was all like, and it was all true. And I was like, dang, like I can't even be mad at him because he was right. Like, so I played better in the second half and like, it was kind of one of those things, like he wasn't disrespectful. He wasn't wrong. He didn't attack me like in a personal way. It was basically like, this is the situation. This is what you're not doing. This is why you're not doing it. And we need you to play better. And I always appreciated that about him is he was you like, you need coaches to coach you and you need coaches to make you better. And you need coaches to like not call you out, but like when you're not playing well enough, like they need to talk to you. Like they need to let you know, like this is unacceptable. This isn't good enough. Like we expect more from you, blah, blah, blah. And like, I always appreciated that about him. Um, And I just like the honesty that he always had. And that was a really good example of it is like, you're not playing well enough. You're feeling sorry for yourself. You're not helping the team win right now and you better figure it out. Steve Wilkes. Oh yeah. I love coach Wilkes. I always thought he got a bad rap at, in Arizona, he got a bum deal there, was not given any time to lay a foundation of what he's capable of. And now he's in Carolina. What are your thoughts on Coach Wilkes? I love Wilkes. He's a really good coach, but he's a great person. And I think he treats people really well. I think it matters to him. He's a Charlotte-based guy. Um, he's had success here at the organization before. I just really, I really like him. He treats people well loves football. He's got a great family. I think he's got a really good feel for managing people. And I think as a coach, that's your kind of your number one job is how to, how to manage people, how to manage players, how to put out fires. And he's, he's really, really good at that. You know, as a DB coach and you know, like the DBs, those guys sometimes have some, uh, some personalities. We certainly had him in Carolina and he did a fantastic job working with those guys. I heard a rumor I heard a rumor. I, we don't have to say what teams. I heard a rumor that you got offered uh, on multiple occasions uh, NFL coaching jobs. And as we discussed earlier, you are instead coaching youth football. What's the thought process there? No desire whatsoever. Just not right now. I don't think I'd ever say never. I think I'd really. I think I'd really enjoy it. I think I have a ton of fun with it. Just you know, the time. Everybody understands the time associated with coaching in the NFL, and you know you. You play for so long, obviously college in the NFL, you give up Thanksgivings, you give up Christmases, you give up, you know, weddings and buddies, weddings and trips that your buds are going on. And as I've gotten older, I value that stuff a lot more. So if I jump back in, I would have to make a choice to say no to Christmas and Thanksgiving. And um, I'm not quite sure that I'm ready to do that. I gave it up a lot when I was playing and I just... Right now is not the right time, but I would never, I would never say never because I love, I love the game and I think it'd be a ton of fun. Well, buddy, I appreciate you. Still to this day, one of the best guys I know. Um, thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing those thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. Always fun talking ball with you. I learned a lot today. I'm also very confused about a lot of it. 
I just got to start watching film of you guys uh, <laughs> and your youth team. Maybe I'll we'll maybe send I'll some over. Better. We can send you the Dropbox link. We'll be good to go. Sounds good, buddy. Well, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. You can listen to Block Forever and other sports content on Audible. Audible is the home of storytelling, audiobooks, originals, podcasts, and more. Start listening free at audible.com. Well, that's the show for today. I love having these kinds of conversations. I hope you enjoy listening to them. I'm still learning a lot, even after all these years of playing. There's a few types of players in the National Football League. There's those who have these God-given talents and can really get by off of athletic abilities. Then there's guys who are hustlers or have a really great understanding of the game. Luke is one of those rare guys who has it all. It's pretty impressive to see a guy with all those abilities and have that kind of humility and it was always very inspiring for me as his teammate and now even as his friend. Reminder, this Thursday, Falcons at Panthers, only on Amazon Prime. All right, that's all for me. Hope you liked it. Talk to you next week. This has been an Audible original production of Block Forever, produced by Fresh Produce and Audiorama. Matt Waxman is our lead producer. Sound design and edit by Kenny Holmes. Our producers are Kenny Holmes and Matt Schrader. Production assistant, Ben Gerstel. And our talent booker is Kristen Dunn. For Audible, executive producer, Pat Shaw. For Audiorama, the executive producer, well, that's me, Ryan Khalil. For Fresh Produce Media, executive producers, Colin Moore, Joe Killian, and Jason Ross. Head of production, Elena Bovitz. Our supervising producer is Jamila Zara Williams. Production coordinator, Henry Koch. And our production manager is Herminio Ochoa. Special thanks to Powerhouse Capital and Mikey Fowler. And I'm your host, Ryan Khalil. Copyright 2022 by Audiorama Inc. Sound recording copyright 2022 by Audible Originals LLC.